Welcome to the fourth part of the lecture on generative modeling. In this part, I will be discussing normalizing flows and sandcastles. So, question, how do you make a sandcastle? Well, easy, right? Step one, destroy a sandcastle. And then step two, reverse the process. Easy, right? Well, this is actually how normalizing flows work. What you do is you start with actually fully created sandcastles and you normalize them and you destroy them basically. And you remember exactly how you did that destruction. And then you generate by reversing that process. And if you slightly change, let's say the normal sand on the right here and you uh, reverse the process, you end up with a slightly different sandcastle on the left. So in terms of probability distributions, what we are doing here is on the left, we have a complex data distribution, right? This P of X. And we've got some examples, some blue examples of this data distribution. And we are going to learn to normalize these points, these blue points to a latent normal distribution. And now we can sample from this latent distribution and generate backwards to create new points in the data distribution domain. Now, to you know, destroy and create sandcastles, we have to ensure that everything we do is invertible. How are we going to ensure uh, that this inverse exists? Answer, use invertible methods. So an invertible mapping is different from the surjection which we are used to in, for example, the encoder of a VAE. So in a VAE, we have a large X space and the Z space is smaller, which by definition means that multiple points in X space are going to have to map to the same point in Z space. This does not work for normalizing flows. Normalizing flows can only work on bijective functions. So a bijective function is any function that maps every point in X space to a unique point in Z space. So we can always move back and forth exactly between the two domains. So how do we implement this in neural networks, you might ask. Now, one example is the affine connection. So over here, we have, for example, an input vector x, which is rather large, and we are going to split this vector into x1 and x2. Then x1 will be pushed through a freely chosen neural network. This neural network can be anything, convolutional, recurrent, linear, it doesn't really matter. And it will output a scale and a translate uh, variable. And we will do a very simple operation on the second part. We will say that Z2 is actually scale times X2 plus translate. And then on the right, what we will have is we will copy X1 over as it is, and then Z2 we will put on the bottom of it. And then we concatenate the two, we concatenate X1 and Z2 to create Z. And then we randomly shuffle the order of dimensions in Z. Why do we do this random shuffle? Well, now we can repeat this operation again and again and again, making sure that every part of X gets its turn, right? Being the conditioning part on the top, as well as the part that is being scaled and translated on the bottom. And the nice thing about this affine coupling network is that it is exactly invertible, right? If we invert this, we only need to change the directionality of all the arrows. So we change the, we flip the direction, right? As you can see, but one set of arrows stays the exact same. We still go from top to bottom. So we never actually need to invert this neural network, which is great because we don't want to calculate its inverse because it might not even exist. So what we have now is the following. On the left, we've got a complex data distribution and we can now do affine flow or more powerful flows, which are outside the scope of this lecture to go to this normal latent distribution. And we can also go in the generative direction because we exactly know the inverse of this mapping. Now, 
great and all that we have this invertible neural network, but what loss function are we going to use to train it? Well, again, similar to the VAE, we're going to do maximum likelihood estimation. So we're going to find the argmax of the data set given the log likelihood. Now, in VAEs, we use the elbow loss for this. But now, because normalizing flows are uh, only and exactly bijective, we can actually get the exact likelihood. Great, right? So the exact likelihood, we show that over here, we've got log p theta of x equal to log p of z when we map x to z. And if we, for example, choose z to follow a normal distribution of mean zero and variance one, you can actually show that this becomes the L2 norm. Simple, right? Well, no, we have to add an extra term. And think about this intuitively. If you look over here at the top, if you only train with this function, if you only train with this L2 norm, won't you just learn to map all x to zero, right? Because the L2 norm is minimized at zero. Well, it's a problem, right? If all x's map to zero, then we're no longer bijective. So we are adding a term. We're adding a log determinant of the Jacobian. This d is the Jacobian of the function. What? Why? Why this extra term? I mean, we have a bijective function, z is fx, and x is f minus 1 of z. Why don't we then also have that the probability in x space is the same as the probability in z space? Well, the answer is as follows. This is a likelihood function we're dealing with, not a probability. We are not preserving likelihood, actually, but we should be preserving probability mass. So we should be preserving the integral here. So the integral on the left side should be equal to the integral on the right side. So we can see, basically, that all of the sand, so to say, all of the mass beneath the curve needs to be the exact same. Here on the left and on the right, I'm not adding or destroying sand. The same as with the sand castle uh, on the beach. So in reality, we are going to have to preserve the amount of sand. Now, if we take the derivative with respect to x on both sides, then on the left, this integral nicely goes away. We don't have to deal with it anymore. But on the right, we have to be very careful because there's a function here. So the product rule then states that we get that thing itself times the derivative of that function. Also, we are taking the absolute value of this derivative. That is because probability should always be positive. Now, in multiple dimensions, this derivative is actually equal to the determinant of the Jacobian. So the determinant of the Jacobian is nothing more than and nothing less than just the derivative, right? The Jacobian will give you a matrix of all the partial derivatives, and then the determinant will account for the change in volume. It will say, okay, how much sand is being pushed away versus how much sand is being squished at this position. So the intuition is as follows. In the normalizing flow, the flow function determines, okay, where a point in X space maps to a point in Z space, and of course the reverse, and the log determinant accounts for the amount of sand we're moving around. Now, how do we calculate the determinant of the Jacobian? Now, in our case, we are stringing many invertible functions together, right? So we have a composition of functions. And then the nice thing is that the log determinant of the entire chain is just going to be the sum of the individual log determinants. So let's go through this. For one step of our affine flow, it's actually fairly simple. Splitting uh, our vector x into x1 and x2 does not move sand around. We're not moving mass. So that's zero. Nice. Now the scale, that is important because with scaling, we are moving mass around. If we take the derivative of this function, right, z equals s times x plus t. If we take the derivative with respect to x, what we end up with is, well, s. So if you take the log determinant, we get the logarithm of the scale. And then concatenation, again, not moving any sand around, so zero. 
And shuffling, well, shuffling, we are basically taking grains of sand individually and flipping them around. While this does change where all of the sand is located, it does not push and stretch the amount of sand in a local neighborhood. So over here as well, the log determinant is zero. So as we can see for this affine flow, it's fairly easy actually what the log determinant is. It's just the logarithm of S. And if we string many of these affine connections after each other, we just get a summation of all of the logarithms of all of the scales. So the training process is as follows. We get an example from the data set, X. We push X to Z, right, with our flow function. And then we account for the change in sand by calculating the determinant of the Jacobian. And in our case, that's just the summation of all scales. And then the loss is as follows. It's log DZ plus the log determinant. In our case, it's just going to be the L2 norm of Z plus a summation over S. And now we can backpropagate easily and update theta. So for example, over here, I have a data set which consists of, let's say, red data and blue data. And it uh, lives in a two-dimensional domain. And it's positioned in this cross shape. Now, if I do four of these affine connections and train with this loss function, what happens is as follows. As you can see, I, in this case over here, I'm not changing this dimension, but I am changing this dimension. There's actually a scale and translate in the horizontal direction happening, as you can see. And then in layer two, the other dimension gets scaled and translated. And then layer three and layer four, and in the end, we end up with nice Gaussian noise. And of course, once we have done this, we can do the reverse. We can sample a normal distribution to get a nice distribution of points and then fold it backwards, do all of the transformations the other way around. And in the end, we also end up with this nice cross data distribution. Now, GLOW, just like GANs and VAEs, can give some very nice results. I've taken these images from uh, the GLOW paper, which is one of the most popular uh, flow architectures out there at the moment. And as you can see, these are some very nice images. So, what have we seen today? We have seen VAEs, we have seen GANs, and we have seen flows. And to summarize, a VAE maps X to Z, Z back to X, we train using the evidence lower bound, and we cannot do exact likelihood estimation, but we can get a bound on it. In a GAN, there's no way to go from X to Z, but we do have a generator which maps from Z to X. And the loss function is, of course, the binary cross entropy. There's no likelihood estimation in a GAN. And then in a flow, we can do all both mappings. They are actually exactly invertible. The loss function is maximum likelihood, and we can do exact likelihood estimation. Well, thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this interesting. If there are any questions, don't hesitate to leave a comment down below.